Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at National Instruments with Sarah Yost, who's going to talk today about what 5G means to you. Sarah, there's a lot of buzz going on about 5G. It's supposedly the next big thing in communications. Where is it uh, in terms of rollout? When do you expect to see it? And what sort of problems will it bring along? Well, so I think 5G is more than just the next big thing in communications. I think 5G is the next big thing in everything. 5G, we hear a lot about it today, but if you ask one person what it is, you're going to get a completely different answer from the next person because it just spans such a broad topic. So when 5G started out, they actually came up with three main application areas and three goals for 5G to tackle. So the first is to improve the enhanced mobile broadband. So that's to make your cell phone, anything mobile related, a lot faster than we have today. Then we have massive machine type control, so with the idea of adding on hundreds of times of devices to what we can handle on our networks today. So you can think of this as an industrialized IoT factory. And then we have ultra reliable machine type control. So that's the idea of adding on a latency spec to our 5G specification for anything, and I like to think of it as anything where a human life is involved. So something where a time critical uh, communication has to come back and forth between one device to another. And so if you think about this in uh, autonomous vehicles, there's a whole debate going on now about whether 5G will suffice in terms of can you use this for preventing accidents or do you have to do more uh, edge type of, of computing inside the car? What's your take in terms of when will 5G be ready for this and will it actually alter the designs? So I think there's different pieces of that 5G model I talked about that are going to play into autonomous vehicles. So you have that enhanced broadband side where we're going to need to send large chunks of data across the network in order to be processed. But then you also have that latency side where we need to be able to do this quickly, very deterministically, very reliably. So as far as the broadband broad-based side of it, we are seeing some rollouts already. So the spectrum below sub six gigahertz that's being used for communications today there's been new bands allocated for this and more bandwidth. So we're already seeing that enhancement come out. Now, if you look at what we have today available versus rolling out something with more bandwidth in the sub six gigahertz today, that's not a massive shift in technology. We already know how to make chipsets very well that do sub six gigahertz. We know how to make those cell phones. We have the infrastructure on the base station. Increasing the bandwidth, not a huge challenge. So I'm thinking those technologies are gonna come out probably in the next one to two years. We're already seeing chipsets from companies like Corvo hitting the market today, so it's only a matter of time before those end up in our pockets. Now, the latency side, I do think it's going to be a bit longer. There's a lot more infrastructure that needs to be built up in order for that for us to be able to meet the demands there. So I think the connected car, we got a while to wait. What does the timeline look like here? Why don't you draw this out for us? Yeah. All right. So if we think about the overall cycle of a standard, so we kind of have this initial phase of research where the actual research is being done. And then once that research is set, we start to see things pick up a bit more looking at the silicon design. Then we start to see mobile devices that are being built. And then we see broad based manufacturing and deployment to a mass group of people. And if we look at this timeline, it typically takes about 10 years to go from one point to another. And where are we now on this timeline? So we're sitting right about here. We've seen a lot of the silicon already been designed and it's getting pushed out into mobile handsets and other designs. But that's just looking at the sub six gigahertz part of it. As far as the millimeter wave part, I'd say we're more maybe in this area over here where there's still a lot of design work that's being done. And we're just starting to see that silicon be rolled out. And one of the issues with 5G is the complexity of the uh, technology is very high. Uh, you also have potential interference of these waves, particularly as you start getting into the millimeter wave, right? Because these are very high frequency. They can be disrupted by, what, people, uh, buildings. You can't get through the windows. You need uh, antennas everywhere. So this takes a lot of time to build enough infrastructure to be able to, to actually deploy this, right? Absolutely. Uh, one of the biggest challenges with millimeter wave is the amount of the signal power that's absorbed in oxygen and that's absorbed in water. So even if, if I were just to walk in between the base station and the cell phone, you would lose connection. But at the same time, what's interesting about millimeter waves, is there's actually a lot of reflections. And so if we just looked at the models, you know, you, you'd see some reflection. But as we've been starting to get more channel data back from doing a channel sounding, 
there's actually a lot more reflections than we initially thought. So it is possible to use a, a phased array antenna to do beam tracking. So I could be walking around and the base station could be tracking me, but it's also possible that to get non-line of sight communication, the beam that I'd be communicating with it is not actually the main one, it would be a reflection of that. It's also possible to get some economies of scale out of this technology, right? Because you can basically send out one signal and that signal could be used or the bandwidth and that bandwidth can be used for multiple different phones for different devices. Yeah, absolutely. And just even looking at some of the new radio that we have today, uh, a typical new radio base station signal has 800 megahertz of bandwidth with eight 100 megahertz subcarriers. So that's one example of how things might be divided to get better density onto our networks. And massive MIMO is another concept of adding on lots and lots more antennas on the base station in order to increase our spectral efficiency. So what does the world look like in 5G? How does that really affect our lives? So today I have my cell phone and I have a base station over here and they can talk to each other. In a world of 5G though, you start to notice, okay, well, my cell phone, it, it's the 2G, 3G, 4G, and so on, but now we also have 5G components. So that alone is getting a lot more complex. I have a lot more features, a lot more apps that you can build on top of it. But now I also have maybe, uh, I don't know, my refrigerator has a camera in it that can tell me when I'm at the grocery store if I'm out of something, or my watch will have uh, be a smartwatch that'll be talking to the base station. Over here we have a factory which might have a bunch of different devices connected using Internet of Things. We can combine that use of Internet of Things with augmented reality to make smart factories. So now you could have someone going in wearing special glasses that can just look around and based off of the data that's being transmitted from the devices, look at the health of every individual sh machine and prevent potential shutdowns before they ever even happen. We also talked about the idea of a connected car where it's talking to the base station, but it's also talking to other cars. And it's also maybe talking to the factory, and it's also maybe talking to my cell phone, and maybe my watch over here, and just everything is gonna be connected. It's no longer just my cell phone. Really, 5G, the idea behind it, and what makes it such a big deal to the economy is that 5G has the potential to be in everything. So we're starting to see just this whole revolution of components and, and uh, devices that we never even thought would be necessary to have a wireless communications aspect to them, suddenly needing that feature to be viable in today's technology. This is also a much more complex technology. What does this do for the development cost? Chips, for example, or devices that use those chips? So we see kind of a split side here. So on one hand, we are reusing a lot of the technology that we know very well today. And because it is going to be deployed in a lot more things, we get the economy of scale. But at the same time, when you look at it, suddenly, you know, the consumer devices that have been so cheap are now adding that extra component in. So it has to cost a lot less money. It also has to cost a lot less money to test. So we have just this whole brand new uh, business case of looking at how do we make those devices much more affordable for consumers. But then you have things like the connected car where, uh, you know, there's an opportunity to make the car itself cost more. So we could put really high-end devices inside of our cars itself. But that's all being passed on to the consumer. There's a whole other aspect of 5G where there's going to be a significant investment in infrastructure that's needed. And how that's going to be paid for is yet to be seen. So that's one challenge of 5G that remains to be solved. Are we building this up to be something bigger than it is in terms of, are we just going to be frustrated because we're not going to be able to get the signals all the time, or we're not going to be able to make the connections that we expect to connect, almost like perpetual drop calls that we get now? So 5G is not going to be perfect. Right now we're sitting here talking about all of the amazing things that 5G could deliver. And it's absolutely going to deliver on some of them, but others it probably won't. But there's one thing that is certain, 5G cannot fail. There is so much money invested in a global scale in this technology that it has to succeed. We see governments in you know, the United States, in China, in Europe, really globally coming together and putting in money towards research and infrastructure that we've never seen before. And so from that investment point alone, it's set up to where it cannot fail on every way. I can't promise that your calls won't get dropped when you go in, in and out of an elevator, but there are definitely things about 5G that are going to be pretty amazing. What happens in terms of power efficiency of this technology? Is it going to be as efficient as 4G or are we going to be using a lot more power to run these things? 
So the technology in and of itself is definitely going to be needing a lot more processing power. Whether or not that processing power actually ends up resulting in me needing a bigger battery on my phone has yet to be seen. You know, as we've seen technology progress and just looking at the idea of computation power in a desktop computer, for example, we've really seen Moore's Law come into effect here. You know, back, back in the day, you might have needed a computer the size of the room that I'm standing in to do some very, very basic computation. And now today I have that processing power in my pocket times, uh, you know, times 100. So we certainly are expecting to see some innovations on the technology side from silicon and from other developers that are going to help bring down the amount of power that's needed to do this processing. But 5G is certainly more complex, and so we will need to have more power at somewhere in the design scale to make it effective. So is the emphasis in a design on the performance itself of the chips because you've already got the higher frequency, or is it on the power and, and control of power? I think there's different aspects of this. On this uh, for IoT, for example, in order for that to be successful, it has to be low power. You have to be able to have something that can you know, operate for potentially years without being charged. And so even just looking on the standard itself of thinking, how can we make a more efficient standard uh, th there's aspects of that design. There's aspects on the antenna side of it where we're looking at how do we get more power transmitted for less overall amplifier inefficiency. And then there's also things on the silicon side. So really every aspect of design is going to be important for making the power efficiencies of 5G meet the, the physical reality of what's needed. Where do you expect to see this rollout first? Is it We've seen it at the Winter Olympics in South Korea where it was uh, showcased. China is making a big push into this. Is it going to be a replacement for what's already there? Is that going to come slower? Is it going to be uh, nothing's there and this becomes a much faster implementation? At this point, I don't think there's one clear winner in the race to 5G. We've seen tremendous investment from China, as you mentioned, and they are certainly making a big push. Uh, in the United States, there's also been a huge push to really be first to 5G. And we've even seen cooperation from the FCC in freeing up new bands to make 5G a reality. And then, of course, the trials in Korea were incredible. They were just phenomenal at showcasing the new technology. So we've really seen, unlike previous examples, there's not just one clear winner. I think everyone is kind of in this race, and it could go anyway. I do think that China is going to be key, and they are talking about deploying straight to the standalone version, so not taking advantage of the LTE core when they deploy their first 5G networks. So that'll look a little different from the United States, who's talking about using non-standalone and really leveraging that 4G infrastructure that we already have to get to a 5G deployment. And we saw this in South America, where they didn't have a telephone infrastructure, and they leapfrogged the, the cable in order to move to cell phones back in the 90s and 80s. This is similar to the same thing, right, where they don't have that massive infrastructure and they can easily move from one to the next? Yeah, ab absolutely. So not having the infrastructure to build off of, it's an obvious choice to go ahead and move forward with 5G. That being said, there are certain aspects of LTE that are still probably going to remain pretty critical and very relevant. 5G is designed by nature to be this ultra high performance beast, but that's not always what's needed. So for example, for rural areas, maybe on a highway where you don't have a long stretch of cars, sometimes the connectivity that's provided by 4G or even 3G is enough to meet the application needs there. But if you're looking at bringing some more IoT type technology to a rural farm, for example, there's definitely a need for the 5G component. So I think there'll still be a mix and match of what technology is needed to best service the population in the area. Sir thanks for a great explanation. All right, thank you.